Welcome to the New Beginning Church Adult Sunday School class. We are here in Isaiah chapter 9. We are about to read the Keep in Mind. So let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for this privilege of honoring you and, and reading your word and studying your word. We ask you to bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so keep in mind. Keep in mind. For unto us a child was born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon us, be upon his shoulder, and his name be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 96. Isaiah 96. When we look at the text, we find out that Isaiah is writing in a time when there's much war going on. He, he is writing when many kings are being, being in leadership. And when he writes, he writes to try to get the people aligned with God. The people are in what is known as darkness. They're in the midst of darkness. And as they're in the midst of darkness, they find themselves far away from God. And as they find themselves far away from God, they realize that the only help they have will be through Jesus Christ. It is just like our situation today. Our government is out of control. Our life in this, this nation is up and down every day. And we find ourselves at a point in our lives where we're walking in darkness. And as we walk in darkness, we need to realize that the situation we're in today, no one can get us out of it but God. Amen. If we're going to be better, if our lives are going to be better, if our nation is going to be better, if our world is going to be better, it's going to take God. And Isaiah is writing and he's telling them that God is the only way out. When we look at the text, we, we find out that the people are now walking in darkness. Let's read, let's read, let's read the text, verses, verses 2 through 7 is what the printed text is, verses 2 through 7. If one of you, Sister Irvin, if you're there, can you read that for us? Verses 2 through 7, Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. Mm -hmm. They joy before thee according to the joy in the harvest, mm -hmm. and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast spoken the yoke, broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But yeah. this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace of the increase of his government and the peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth ever, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. Amen. Thank you. When we look back at our in focus, as our brother read, uh, Andrew is going to funerals. Yes. He is going, Andre, is going to funerals. He's going to one funeral at the other. <laughs> All of his friends, and now the fifth funeral he goes to uh, is a friend that he's very close to. Yes. So the author tells us and reminds us that funerals are going to happen. Amen. That, that our friends are going to leave right before our eyes. And then one day, guess what? We're going to leave our friends. No. One of these days, we're going to get out of here. <laughs> amen, amen. We're going to leave it. We're going to leave planet Earth. 
And when we leave planet Earth, we got to be right with God. We must be right. We, we have to look forward to being right with God. So he says that Andre was sitting in another funeral, and he's sitting there in unbelief. The last three months, he's been to four different funerals. Now he's sitting in the funeral of his friend James, and this really hit him hard. Have you ever been to a funeral of a loved one or a friend that it hit you different than anybody else? My brother. And it, it came across like no other funeral. My brother did that too. And the, the funeral was devastating to you and devastating to the whole family. And it's devastating to the whole friendship. It talks about the fact that he's at James' funeral and James were very young. James was a young person. Let me tell you, all around us today, young people are dying. Young people are getting killed. Young people are, are getting shot. Young people are having accidents and dying. There's death all around us. And every day, a young person lives here, leaves here. And we believe that young people ought to live longer than seniors, right? We believe that parents ought to be buried by their children. Amen. But now we have a lot of children being buried by their parents. So that was the old days. The old days when I was coming up, uh, children were burying their parents, but now you have reversed. So every day, it's, it's heartbreaking. 16 year old gets shot by a police officer this week because he's trying to rob something. Young people have to learn to work to make their own money, to make their own way. And people are dying in a senseless way. People are dying in their houses, not doing anything wrong. They're, they're dying. They're being killed. And it was that way in, in Isaiah day, but it was on a large scale. It was the entire nations being wiped out. They were living in darkness. So as James, at James' funeral, Andre looks at this funeral. He knows the reason why his friend is dead, and he decides that he's going to take matters in his own hands. What did he decide? What did Andre come to the conclusion? He wanted to get even. He, he wanted, wanted to get even. He How wanted did, to kill somebody. He wanted he to kill know somebody. Who the killer was. So, uh, is it our place to go take? Is it our place? Is it our place to go and? And, and kill somebody? No, it's not our place. So what do you do when you know who the killer is? You fall back on your training with the Lord has put in, put in your heart. Okay, so so when you when you know who the killer is, that's your friend, it hits you hard, your emotions are raging, is it your place to go take, take vengeance? No. Why not? That's no. what we usually do, right? Because no, not God. Huh? Not God. Well, the personal life that was taken wasn't taken by God, right? Do we normally think that way, though? Do we normally get to a point where I can say I can handle this? I take care of this. Some people does. Uh, some people. And this story, this man, he felt like he could. Mm -hmm. But he realized that, that if he had went back and took care of this guy, because he brought him into the group, and he took care of him. Somebody was going to eventually take care of him. So the cycle was going to keep it going. So he wanted to stop the cycle. Okay. So as Andre sits in his friend's funeral and he's thinking of it in his mind, then another friend, Anthony, says, wait a minute. Don't do it. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. What does that mean, vengeance belongs to the Lord? God vengeance. Control. Vengeance. Vengeance means to retaliate, right? Mm -hmm. So God has a way of dealing with it. When we look at the text in Isaiah 9, the Israelites have done their thing again. What have they done again? They sinned again. <laughs> and their sin is not just one thing. They sin in a big way. And the way they sin is that they turn away from the awesome God. They turn away, and when they turn away from God, bad things start happening. 
the people that walk in darkness. They are walking in darkness. But now the good news is they've seen a great light. Isn't that good news? They've seen a great light. And, and they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them had a light, have the light shine. So even though they're walking in darkness, even though their lives are messed up, even though they're sinning, God has a way of blessing us and he shines up great light. God wants to bless us. They, they wasn't there because of what God had done. They were there in this darkness because of what they have done. And let me tell you, many times we put ourselves in a position and we blame other people and some of us even blame God. But let me tell you, we put ourselves in position where we need to depend on God. We put ourselves in a bad position and we really expect God to get us out. And when God gets us out, guess what we do? Go we go back again. Why do we do that? So, servant, why do people keep doing that? They're still in darkness. So we got to get out of the darkness. They see the great light shining. They are walking, as the psalmist says, in the valley of the shadow of death. Look at what he says in verse number two. Upon them hath light shined. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Shadow of death is darkness. The shadow of death, there's no light. Matter of fact, there's death. The Bible says that the light shine upon them. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. Regardless of how many people show up in the great United States of America, we ought to have joy, but it takes God to increase the joy. Thou have multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in the harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. We're talking about war, right? And as we talk about war, we realize that when a, a nation goes in and fights against another nation, they, stay, they take the good things out. That's what it means to spoil. They take the food. They take the money. They take whatever is of good, good things. We have several wars going on right now. What are some of them? National wars, nation wars. Israel and Hamas. 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 Palestinians. We have wars all around us, right? Ukraine. We have wars all around us. And if you notice, they are destroying things. It's known as the, the, the burnt earth policy where they come in and burn up everything, bomb everything, and tap everything. And the part that really gets me is, you know, those that are in those biblical cities and things, that's the part that really puzzles me because I feel that that should be the most peaceful, those should be the most peaceful places in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. So our Bible tells us about Jerusalem, about Israel, about Judah, and, and we talk about how holy the place of Jerusalem ought to be. But you know what? You don't have to watch soap operas. <laughs> you can pick up your Bible. It is a soap opera. And when, when you pick up your Bible, you will see that some of the most ruthless people in the world live during that day. And they still live. And we're mimicking it. Exactly. We're mimicking it today. And people don't care about the city being holy. They don't care about the church being holy. They don't care about the God we serve being holy because they're walking in darkness. Yes, ma'am. Because, because they don't care because it's not in their heart. When you take it into your heart, you feel something when you see a city and people are dying. You feel something and, and feel like a piece of you dying. Mm -hmm. And it's troubling. It is greatly troubling when you see people being pushed out of their homes, their homes being destroyed right before their eyes. And instead of them using the medical areas to help the wounded, yeah. they've taken over the medical areas of children. 
to be there to, to throw out more bombs. It's like going downtown and taking over the medical center and make it a place to bomb, a place for soldiers to, to bomb the place, a place for soldiers to tear up the place even more. When people get to a point where they have no respect for God, no respect for the community, then they're walking in darkness. It says, it's, it compares them to, to the dividing of the spoil. Verse 4, for thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor as in the day of Midian. God has God has, has, has broken the burden. God has a way of blessing us even when we are oppressed. That's why vengeance belongs to the Lord. Amen. Vengeance belongs to the Lord because God is able to make things right. We don't, have to, we don't have to go against anybody else. We don't have to fight against people. Give it to God. Now, is that easy to do? Is it easy to give it to God? Is it easy for God to fight our battles? Is it easy? No, I think so. Hmm? I think it's easier to give it to God. It's easy to give it to God. Now, I'm talking about giving it to God and you're not fighting the battle yourself. Is it easy? It depends. It depends? If it's a, like you were talking about Anthony earlier, mm -hmm. uh, if it's, if it's your family member, you may feel a little different. But if it's a friend. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, it, it just depends on the heart. You get the so thing. let me ask you. Does God's message to us change based on what whether never, we love the person or not? It never changes. So if it's our loved one, is it okay for us to take revenge? Mm -hmm. No, it's not, it's not okay. Well, I'm not going to get in trouble. <laughs> I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not going to. But I, I thought Paul said because I know my way <clears throat> would not be the way God wants it to be. That's true. So, but the thought does cross your mind, just like Anthony, uh, like Anthony said earlier, that uh, if he if, if he goes through with this, then somebody's not going to come back and go through it with him. So it got to stop somewhere. Okay. So it has to stop. So everybody in this room agree that it's very easy to let the Lord handle the battle. Yeah. Yes. That's well, I got some go. holy folk in here this morning. That's the way to go. Huh? That is the way to go. It's Ma'am? It's not that easy to do. It's not easy to do it? It's the same thing that I said earlier. It's not easy, but you have to go that way. So what, how do you get to a point where you decide, okay, God, it's on you. You can handle this for me. How do you get to that point? We know it's not easy. Well, a lot of But we're like Sister Irvin said, we can't get in trouble. But how do you get to the point where you just say, vengeance belongs to the Lord? You will repay. You just have to continue to repeat it. Just got to continue to repeat it. And Even as you're walking out the door to take vengeance, you got to repeat it. Yeah. No, I'm not going to go, go to jail for nobody. <laughs> I'm not doing so that. is it jail that keeps us straight? It, it keeps me straight. I'm not going to jail for people. <laughs> it's the or should it be God that keeps us straight? God that keeps me straight because of. God it's says, God. It's God, it? Yeah, it's God, God that says, hey, it, this belongs to me. Sister Bernie, how do you handle stuff like that? Don't incriminate yourself now. We're going to have a prayer read for you after church is over. <laughs> God, God says, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay. And the thing about God, when he repays, he repays in a big way. Look at, look at verse number five. For every, val every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Every battle, check out what he says. He says, Every battle comes with confusion of noise. Every fight that we get into leads to more and more confusion, and it's a great noise. 
And at the end of the day, there's bloodshed. And you just roll the garments up and it's rolled up in blood. Can you imagine that much blood? Mm -hmm. Remember, vengeance belongs to the Lord. Mm -hmm. But we take God's place and we say, we gonna repay. It ends up with confused noise and it ends up with garments of rolled up blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. God has a better plan than we have. God has a better plan because we just keep fueling the fire. We just keep messing up. Anybody got anybody in mind that, that you watched go down this road and they messed up their lives? I mean, just messed up. They decided to take vengeance on their, in their own hand and they messed up their entire life. We see it every single day. Young people, seniors, messing up their lives trying to get back to somebody else. Then Isaiah gives us hope in the last two verses. He gives the last two printed verses. Isaiah gives us hope. And when he gives us hope, we realize that this, this prophet Isaiah is very influential. He's one of the most, the author talks about the fact that he's one of the most influential uh, Old Testament writers of that day. We have a southern kingdom and we have a northern kingdom, right? And in the southern kingdom, you have Judah and Benjamin, two tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel. And in the northern kingdom, you have 10 different tribes of Israel. So the southern kingdom is known as Judah. The northern kingdom is known as Israel. But guess what? Regardless of what part of the kingdom you go to, it's nothing but people. <laughs> and people have the same mindset. When it comes to God, it doesn't matter if you go to River Oaks or Third Ward, Fifth Ward, Second Ward, people are messing up with God. Whether it's blue collar mistakes or, or whether it's white collar mistakes, people are voluntarily messing up with God. But there's hope. We celebrate this day and tomorrow we celebrate Christmas. We, we celebrate the Christ child. So Isaiah is predicting the Christ child. He is, he's predicting that, that there will be hope. Now, he's making this prediction many, many years before Jesus shows up. So it says that God spoke to men of old. He spoke to them and they prophesied way ahead of time. And when they prophesied, they prophesied the coming of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is our only hope. Let's look at it. Isaiah Chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 is where he just dumps hope. I mean, he just dumps hope on us. He dumps hope on us. He dumps hope. He just gives us hope. Anybody need some hope in these dark times, these bad situations? Let's look at it. He says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is is given. He says to us that this is not just any other child. Isaiah didn't have to predict a child being born because children being born then and now. Children were being born every day, several times a day. But Isaiah points out this fact, a child is born. It suggests to us and it tells us and we know then it's not just any old child. And I know your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren are not just any other child either, but, but Isaiah pinpoints this child that's being born, and he makes a big deal out of it. Why is it a big deal that he makes out of this, this child being born? Why is, this, why is that a big deal? Why is it a big deal that this child being born? I know to your household, there's a big deal when any of your children are born, right? Why is it a big deal that this? 
The reason why it's a big deal that this child is being born because he's going to change all of history. Jesus Christ being born changed everything. First thing we know is before Jesus was born, we, were, we didn't even have an A.D. and a B.C. But now if we're going to recognize time and years, we're going to have to say B.C. or A.D. That's before Christ or after the death of Christ. In other words, in the year of our Lord. A.D. means in the year of our Lord. So Christ splits history. This child is being born. Everybody in the world is going to recognize that he's born after this day that Isaiah talks about. Whether you are a believer or not, you got to understand if you're going to put some time or some years down, you have to understand that it's either B.C. or A.D. Christ splits time. We judge our days, our years by Christ. So this child is born. It's not just any old child. Then he says, a son is given. As there talks about the fact that a son is given. Now, when he talks about a child is born and a son is given, he's taking us back to the divinic covenant. Covenant. The divinic covenant says that on the throne will always set a descendant of David. How did Jesus get to be a descendant of David? Because of Joseph. Who was Joseph in Jesus' life? Who was Joseph? His stepdad. <laughs> uh, that word is his stepdaddy. <laughs> Let's just say he's his earthly dad. He's his earthly father. <clears throat> Joseph is Jesus' earthly father. And because he's his earthly father, now he is a part of the lineage. Jesus is a part of the lineage of David. So he's a part of the generations of David. It says a son is given. And this son is the son of God. He is the son of God. When we look at John 3, 16, it says that for for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The word begotten is one of a kind son. God gave his one of a kind son. The word begotten means unique son. There's nobody like Jesus. So unto us a child is born, a son is given. This son is the son of God. He is the legitimate, legitimate. He is the legitimate a king who others and us will recognize him as the king of kings. He is legitimate. He's born, he's born just like any other human being. He's given like no other human being. Jesus Christ has the same power as the creator. Jesus Christ have the same frailties and has the same weaknesses as human beings. Therefore, we get the word of what? He's just as much God as God, just as much man as man. What is the word for it? The hyperstatic union, right? So Jesus Christ gives us the hyperstatic union. This hyperstatic union means that, that Jesus is just as much God as God. He's just as much man as man. So unto us a child is born, just like any other human. Unto us a son is given, no one like him. He's the son of God. He possesses the power of the creator. But he also has the frailty. Like man, Jesus cried. Like God, Jesus forgave them. Like man, Jesus bled. But like God, Jesus walked on water. Like man, Jesus felt pain. But like God, he was able to forgive them that gave us pain. He just keeps showing up and showing us that he alone is the hyperstatic union. Just as much God as God. 
and just as much man as man. He goes on to say, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. We certainly need the government in somebody else's hand. <laughs> in these great United States of America, we need the government to be in somebody else's hands. We need Jesus. <laughs> we don't need Republicans right now. <laughs> we don't need Democrats right now. We don't need independence right now. We're in so much trouble in this nation, in this world, we need Jesus. The Bible says the government should be up on his shoulder. Jesus is the one that will carry the burden. This government will rest on his shoulders because he's the only one qualified. He's the only one that can carry our burdens. That's why it says my yoke and my burden. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So this is the Messiah. His name is Jesus. He's capable of being the ruler. We have folk in office now that are not even capable of ruling. They're not there for the right reason. But Jesus is a capable, a capable ruler, and not only is he capable, he does it well. He does. He doesn't have any political preferences. He wants all of us to succeed. Amen. He wants all of us to be great. He wants all of us to follow him. He is the Messiah. He is the ruler. And the, your, your author talks about the fact that he's the sovereign ruler. What does the word sovereign mean? He's the sovereign ruler. Sovereign ruler. Because when you look back at your verses, you find out that there's confusion in verse number five. But the sovereign ruler, Jesus himself, doesn't have any confusion. There is no confusion. Men and kings and presidents, mere men have confusion. That's why we're so confused today. We are so confused. And we're confused because we're being led by mere men. But this government, if this government is upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ, there will be no confusion. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? Anybody? No confusion. There'll be no confusion. If we just walk with Jesus, that doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems. But there will be no confusion. The Bible says the devil is the author of confusion. When you walk with Jesus, there's no confusion. So he is the ruler. The government shall be upon his shoulders. The government shall rest on him. He is the one who can carry us through. His name is Jesus. And we should not wait to this time of year to talk about how good of a leader and ruler Jesus is. He ought to be ruling your life every day. He ought to be a part of your life every day. He ought to be governing your life every day. Is Jesus governing your life? Or are you in control? Yeah, yeah. When, when, when we're in control, our emotions govern our, what we do. When we're in, we in control, we do what we want to do. When we're in control, Sister Bernie, guess what happened? We take revenge. <laughs> We get after it. I go to jail. <laughs> we go to jail and be willing to go to jail when we have control of our lives. But the author, uh, Isaiah says to us that Jesus is coming. He's going to be over the government. He's going to be the one that, that have the government on his shoulders. Goes on to say he is the wonderful. Songwriter said, wonderful. He's so wonderful. He is wonderful. Now, some people have taken these, these words, wonderful in counseling, and made them as one. But you got to stop and realize that Jesus Christ is wonderful. What makes Jesus wonderful in your life? Anything. What, what, what do you know about Jesus that makes him wonderful in your life? 
Yes, sir. Save my soul. Save my soul. That's enough to make him wonderful. He is wonderful. And there is no one who compares to him. He saved my soul. Guess why he saved your soul? Because you couldn't save your soul yourself. And if you can't save yourself from yourself, you need Jesus to save you. Amen. What else makes him wonderful? Anybody else? Anybody else makes? Why is Jesus wonderful in your life? He's wonderful. Is he wonderful in your life? <coughs> He keeps on blessing you. In spite of. In spite of what? In spite of in spite of what we do, in spite of who we are, in spite of our meanness, in spite of our cussing, in spite of our backbiting, in spite of our gossip, in spite of our drinking, in spite of our smoking, God just keeps on, Jesus just keeps on showing himself wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's the next one. He's the wonderful counselor. You can you can tell him stuff and you ain't got, you won't hear it on Never the street. Yes. <laughs> Why not? Because he's a wonderful counselor. Right. <clears throat> he is a wonderful counselor. You don't have to worry about him telling your business. And he blesses you. And he blesses you. He's wonderful. He's a counselor. And he's a wonderful counselor. Yes. His name is Jesus. Yes. So, sir, you want to tell us some of the things you told Jesus that you, you hadn't told anybody? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 sir, glance to that. Every day, be my comfort. Even though he knows my innermost thoughts, he knew me even before I was born. So Amen. He knows, he knows you. Have you ever told Jesus some stuff that you want him to work on? Because he's a wonderful counselor, right? Yeah. And as a wonderful counselor, the, the counselor always gives recommendations. Yeah. Now it's up to you to handle those recommendations. Yes, ma'am. And he, I have asked for some things, and he'll bless me with some things. Too. He's actually for, you've asked him for some things. Mm -hmm. So he's the wonderful counselor. This counselor has wisdom that never ends. Arthur talks about him having infinite wisdom. He is wise. What took us so long to come to Jesus? Now that we realize he's a wonderful counselor, we look back at our days and we're like, Lord, why did it take me so long to come? In, Just turn it over to Jesus. In, in maturity. In maturity. We had to grow to it. Yeah, in maturity in him. Right. We had to grow to it, right? Mm -hmm. so, so he's a wonderful counselor. He has infinite wisdom. Here it is. Jesus has infinite. What does infinite mean? Infinite wisdom. What does infinite? Infinite wisdom. What does that mean? He has infinite wisdom. I mean, he has no end. He has no limitations. He has infinite wisdom. Jesus doesn't have to search for wisdom. Jesus doesn't have to pray, Lord, tell me what to say. He's a wonderful counselor, and this counselor already knows what you need. Amen. He has infinite wisdom. He's a wonderful counselor that knows what you need before you know what you need. Great. He has infinite wisdom, meaning that he has wisdom before you get in trouble. He has wisdom <laughs> while you get in trouble. <laughs> he has wisdom while you're in trouble. And he has wisdom to get you out of trouble. And he has wisdom to keep you from getting in trouble. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the wonderful counselor. Now man has <clears throat> limitations. Man has frailties. Men have to pray in order to get wisdom. And that wisdom doesn't last always. You know, many times I'm walking in a room with, with some people, whether it's a couple or a single or uh, a group, even before Bible study or Sunday school, I'm asking God, God, give me wisdom. Give me words. 
Give me mannerism. Give me what to say. Give me the right voice. Because I don't have infinite wisdom. I thought that I was the only one that did that. You did? I, when I prayed. You thought you were the only person I, on planet Earth no, that did I, that? No, I, I, I thought that when I prayed, mm -hmm. I, when I prayed before the congregation, I asked the Lord to give me the words to say. I'm going to take sex out of it. That's my prayer. So the, the, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit gives us utterance when we don't know what to say. Jesus has infinite wisdom. He has no limitations. He is effective. My Sunday school teaching may not be effective, but when I submit myself to Jesus, I'm effective. When Jesus teaches, it's effective. We have to submit ourselves to him because he has infinite wisdom. No limitations. He is able to implement the plan and make the plan happen. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the wonderful counselor. And this counselor is gentle with us. Some counselors just rough. But this counselor understands us. He understands what we're going through. He understands what we've been through. And he even understands what we're going to go through. He is the wonderful counselor. His name is Jesus. What's the next thing he says about Jesus? He says that Jesus is not only a wonderful counselor, but he's the mighty God. He's the mighty God. The word mighty comes from the word omnipotent or omnipotent. He is not just mighty. He is almighty. Amen. He is the mighty God. He is omnipotent, omnipowerful. Omni means everywhere, all places, everything. He is omnipotent. He is omnipowerful. He is the mighty God. Talking about the same Jesus. There is none like him. There is no one who compares to him. His name is Jesus. He is the mighty God. He is omnipotent. Amen. He is omnipotent. He is almighty. He is all powerful. He is the absolute deity and the absolute savior. There's nobody compares to him. You know what? Brother said that he, he, he thinks Jesus is wonderful because he saved my soul. There's no one else qualified. He's almighty. It's almighty God. And Isaiah, Isaiah is telling this group of people that the God we serve is coming in the flesh. And this God, even though he's in the flesh, he's going to be on, on the powerful. On the mighty. Omnipotent. Omnipotent. His name is Jesus. He is the mighty God. He is the mighty God. What else does he say about, about Jesus? Not only is he the mighty God, he's the everlasting father. We're talking about Jesus. He's the everlasting father. There's no end to him. He makes provision for us. A father makes provisions, right? Mm -hmm. We expect the daddy to go out and make money, bring food home. That's what we expect, right? Yes? We expect the daddy to pay the bills. We expect the daddy to buy a house. We expect the daddy to give us food, clothes, and shelter, right? Yes. The God that we serve, Jesus himself, mm -hmm. he makes provisions for us, and the author says he's compassionate. He makes provision for us. He is the everlasting father. His fatherhood has no ending. He's the everlasting father. He was the father before we got here. This Jesus, this everlasting father is the first person. Listen to this real well. He's the first person who was the everlasting father before children were born. 
Let me say that again. This everlasting father was the father before children showed up. You only become a father. You only acknowledge on Father's Day because you have children. But this Jesus is the everlasting father before children showed up. Look at that. He was the everlasting father even in eternity past. He's the everlasting father in eternity. And he's an everlasting father in eternity future. There's nobody like Jesus. You want me to shout in Sunday school this morning. There is no one like the everlasting father, Jesus himself. He offers compassion and provision to us. He takes care of his children. That's why sometimes when we're talking, we say, Jesus, our father, and we haven't made a mistake because he's the everlasting father. Herein is the Trinity. The hypostatic union is real. Just as much God as God, just as much man as man, the hypostatic union. Here also is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He's the everlasting Father. And now when we pray, now that Jesus is no longer on the scene in the flesh, the Holy Spirit is present, we pray, God have mercy. We pray unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because he's the everlasting Father. He lasts from now on. He has compassion. He makes provision. He cares for us. He loves us. And those who fear him and obey him, he makes provision for us. Can you shut down God's blessings? Can you stop God from blessing you? Can you hinder God's blessings? Look how y'all looking at me. You can't stop God from blessing you. Okay, it's explain. It's you to have this blessing. Okay, explain. Anybody else? Can you, can you hinder God's blessing? When we look at the text now, remember, the background is Israel, Judah, has gotten to a point where God is not blessing them. They're walking in darkness because what they have done. How they walked away from God. That's why the author talks about those who love God, those who fear God, and those who obey God. If you fear God, Obey God. If you love God, blessings keep right on flowing. When we look at Luke chapter 15, there's a boy there called, we know him as the prodigal son. The prodigal son leaves home with his daddy's goods. He goes out and he spends all. He finds himself in the middle of a famine. He finds himself in the hog fields and he's about to eat the hog food. Now he was always the boy, he was always his daddy's son. He was just his daddy's bad son. Always had that relationship with his daddy. But he had broken fellowship with his daddy. And when you break fellowship, your blessings shut off. God gives to those who love him, fears him, and cares for him. God always gives to everybody, right? God is even given to the man on the street. But our decisions, our actions, hinder God's blessings. Yes? Questions or comments? Let's clear it up. Any questions? Any comments? Yeah. Yes? So we can hinder God's blessings, right? Mm -hmm. We can hinder it because of our disobedience. That's what the Israelites did. They hindered God's blessings to themselves through disobedience. And God sat back and takes his hands off and, and the rest of the nations beat him kill them, shut down their blessings. They cry out to God in the wilderness, God gives them quail. They cry out to God after they sin, and God gives them manna. But they shouldn't have even been in the wilderness if they just had obeyed God. How many of you want to wander through the wilderness doing the same thing, the same way when it could have taken you a week to get there? It's scary. <laughs> Snakes. They were getting bit by snakes. God opened up the earth. Whole family. Fell in the hole. Closed the earth back up. He's such a merciful God. We don't have to go down that way. We don't have to go out that way. 
What's the next thing that Isaiah called Jesus? Not only is he a wonderful counselor, not only is he the mighty God, not only is he the everlasting father, he is the prince of peace. He is the prince of peace. He controls everything. He keeps everything. If we're going to have peace, we better look to Jesus. Peace in the Middle East. Peace in the United States. Peace we need to, peace in the home. We need to call, peace in the church. Yeah. We need to call Jesus. We need to call on Jesus. We got to call on him. <clears throat> what time is it? Um, it's about 57. Hmm? 9.57. So he's a, he's a prince of peace, everlasting father. His name is Jesus. He, he brings peace. He rules with peace. He sustains peace. He is perfect peace, and he gives us perfect peace. He gives us rest. He gives us confidence. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and the peace there shall be no end. There will be no end to his peace. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. God will perform it. Jesus says, my peace I give unto you. If you really want to have peace, you need Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, it's obvious that you don't have peace. Because he's the prince of peace. And there may be somebody listening that have not received Jesus as your personal savior. This is your moment. If you would, bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, believe in the story of his death, burial, and resurrection, you are born again, you are saved, you're on your way to heaven. If you want to join our church on Sunday morning for 9 a.m. Sunday school, please come and visit with us or at 10.30 a.m. or both for worship service. Come and visit with us. We're located at 4251 Sure My Road, Houston, Texas. That's 4251 Sure My Road, Houston, Texas. 77048 USA. If you want to give to our ministry, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. Or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Please uh, continue to join us for Sunday School Bible Study at, at 715 on Wednesday night. And uh, we are virtually for the rest of the year. And then we'll pick up with our prayer time in January and also for worship service at 1030 a.m. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.